Welcome to my talk on emotions. I find this topic very interesting because emotions are our most intense experiences, but yet when we try to find words for them, we often fail. But when we do find words, we can find some very interesting pattern in them. So, as I want to guide you through the different views on emotions, I'd like to you to think of them in terms of three main categories. You may refer to them as representing the past, the present and the future. But that is not entirely true because these views in fact coexist. Let me give you an example. Traditionally, the heart would be the source of all emotions. And in language and literature, it is still is. So if I said, I love you with all my brain, it wouldn't really work. So, but now as we move on, we will find an increasing number of devices in uh, laboratories and universities that not only display emotions, but also recognize them. So, once again, we are faced with a question, what exactly is an emotion? Is it something that is tied to the specific hardware in our head? Or is it something that exists in its own right? But now I've told you too much already. Let's go through it one at a time. So, traditionally, many scholars from many different cultures would ask themselves, what in this physical and objectively observable world corresponds to what we feel as emotions. Most likely they would find the heart. The heart beats quickly when we are at unrest and it beats slowly when we are calm. Naturally, this doesn't fully explain the richness of the emotions and so they came up with ideas like a soul or an astral body. Um, but people talked about emotions. Aristotle, uh, Aristotle published a list of emotions where he described the different uh, variations and even gave advice which emotions to feel and which not. Men, for example, were advised not to express fear. Females should not express anger. Other views on emotions made some allegorical connections between emotions and certain organs in the body. For example, the spleen was a sign of a, a good or bad humor. The gallbladder made the difference between an ill and well-tempered character. But these uh, were just allegories and didn't really explain why emotions are here and where do they come from. This would change in 1872 when Charles Darwin published his book on the expression of uh, emotions in man and animals. For the first time in history someone expressed the idea that emotions would actually come entirely from the processes that work in the physical world. Or as Darwin said it, the expression of the emotion is the emotion. So, to some extent you can test this hypothesis. When you force yourself to smile, you would become happier within some limits, of course. Nowadays, with modern technology, we can see better where emotions come from and with brain scans we can see that there is the amygdala Amygdala is the part in the brain that is uh, um, involved in all emotional experiences. So, for example, when we um, feel fear, only the amygdala would be active, and there's one in each hemisphere. Only would these amygdala would be ac active, and everything else would be would be black in the brain. So, because animals, mammals have an amygdala too, we think that many of them experience fear in the same way as we do. So, but the question is, why would we experience fear in the first place? Well, actually fear makes us do a lot of things. It increases our heartbeat, it makes our eyes open, 
it makes our mouth open and we actually prepare for a fight or some uh, action. Um, let me give you another example for a more complex emotion that is experienced also for a, um, for a purpose. That is the uh, uh, disgust. Disgust is experienced um, when we see something that might be intoxicating. When we um, experience disgust, we make a face like this. We are trying to hide our nostrils and protect our, our eyes from intoxicants entering our body. Disgust also um, goes from, uh, it's not only experienced to a notional stimuli, but also to the person who um, interacts with something disgusting. So when some person does something disgusting, we find that person disgusting. Additionally, when this uh, stimuli uh, maintains for a certain period of time, disgust goes away within uh, a typical time for an incubation phase. So uh, when it's not dangerous, disgust goes away too. So um, we have seen that there is different, there might be different things that cr uh, create emotions throughout different cultures, but how are emotions expressed differently in different cultures? There have been studies that um, basic emotions like surprise, uh, disgust, fear and anger are understood and expressed in the same way that, uh, throughout cultures, but there are some subtle differences that um, have been studied by, um, by Paul Ekman and I would like to introduce these results to you. Um, what he basically argued is that our mouth is well trained because we use the mouth for speaking and eating. So we can control the mouth but not so well our eyes. So in Eastern cultures where expressing emotion strongly is frowned upon, you would, uh, you would see people more focusing on the eyes and maybe smile with the mouth. Um, whereas Western, culture, Western cultures we find it very normal to express emotions and we are more trained to focus on the mouth because that's where we express our emotion directly. This difference also can be seen in the way we use emoticons. Emoticons are text-based um, expression of an emotion that we use in a text message or an email. So in the West we would use a colon and a closing parenthesis to express a two eyes and a smiling mouth, or we would use a colon and an opening parenthesis to express a frowning mouth. To many Asians, this would not look like happy and unhappy, but more like polite and impolite. In the East, they would have emotions that focus on the eye, while a, a small O and a big O, that would be like some scrutiny or some doubt or they would have uh, two carré signs that would reflect the upward bending eyes that we show when we smile. A, a, a true smile has a contraction of the muscle on the uh, lower lid. So the eye, a true smile would um, bend our eyes upward a bit and um, they, they wouldn't even show a mouth in their emotion or in their emoticon you would say. So, now, as you have seen that emotions are a very important tool for communication, we might think of a further application of emotions as a pure tool that would, not, uh, that would free us from uh, seeing emotions as a state of our brain, but as a tool. So, um, consider sitting in a group and you have a meeting and you can quickly see that through emotions you can express complex ideas like you agree or disagree or uh, you have some doubt about something, you have some disagreement with a very specific person, you can communicate these ideas extremely quickly. 
So emotions are in fact a useful tool. So, but how does it work? Um, let me go with you to a new emotional expression, the smile. The smile has been shown by psychologists that we show it to other people. We would not smile if we are alone. We are much more likely to smile when we see other people. So, but why would we smile? Well, um, I'd, like, I'd like to call this the uh, Facebook of the prehistoric era. Because actually 200 or 400 to 200,000 years ago, when our facial expression were formed in the evolutionary process, nature made us reveal our emotional state um, instinctively, without our control. So actually we express emotions, all kinds of emotions, we express instinctively and rapidly. And therefore, we were giving up some of our privacy. We were, it might, it, at first it might seem to not make sense, we were actually giving up privacy and let other people see what we do and what we think. So, um, but as a whole for society, this, may, this was a big advantage because we could not cheat that well on each other. Uh, there is some research on cooperation with some um, uh, prisoner's dilemma or some social dilemma games where you actually can gain by cheating the other, but um, you have some lower but fairer, fairer game, uh, fairer, fairer uh, reward when you cooperate. And um, you, we can see that people who smile are more likely to cooperate and people who are smiled at are also more likely to cooperate. So we can see that our willingness to cooperate or cheat was expressed well through a smile and we seem to have some uh, innate reception for another people's smile. Um, so um, when we want to uh, discuss further about how to use um, emotions for communication, we have to think about expressing them and processing them digitally. So how can you express something as complex as an emotion with numbers? This idea, in fact, is not new. It was first introduced by Wilhelm Wundt in 1894 where he came up with three numbers to express an emotion. His system was further revised and today we mostly use the system came up by, um, by Ertl in 1965. So basically he said there is three numbers which is the valence, the arousal and the potency. Valence would be how much I like it, agree or disagree. Arousal, how much it surprises me and potency, how much I am likely to act. For example, disgust would have a low valence, I dislike it, it would have low arousal, I'm more or less pa um, uh, steady in a state, longer, it's a longer experience and it's, I'm passive, so it's low potency. If I experience um, anger, for example, it would have a low valence, a high arousal, I'm furious, I'm aroused, and it would have a high potency because I'm likely to attack. So, um, with these numbers, as, pro as promised, you can use emotions for uh, computer communication. Ma who knows, maybe uh, one day we will. So, um, I wanted you to think of emotions in terms of three main categories and those categories where uh, the emotions coming from the heart, the traditional view, where the emotions express our inner self, emotions coming uh, from the brain, where they serve us and help us in our struggle for survival, and emotions as a tool for communication, a tool that in the future we might use uh, and share with machines. 
So now I wish you to have um, no, not only fun, but a variety of emotions and enjoy. <laughs>